Hi everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Wood Turning. This week we're going to do five natural inlays in some really beautiful walnut, including two inlays that I've never shown here on the channel. These really make some awesome bowls. Please stick around to find out how I did it. Well, this should make the inlay purists happy. Uh, my future daughter-in-law informs me that they have three weddings this year. And she's looking for a couple of gifts for some other people. And uh, she wanted inlaid bowls. So that's what all these five are. I'm going to do five bowls for her. Uh, I know that we haven't really been doing a whole lot of this. But... Um, that's what this video is going to be. First things first, we're going to put a glue block on the bottom of each one of these, and then that way we can uh, pump them out. So this really brings me back to my production days. In my production days when I was doing shows, I would do about, I don't know, probably 20 to 25 of these a week, usually larger bowls than what you see here. So the first thing I want to do is clean off any anchor seal that's on the bottom and as you've seen there was a box full of uh, waste blocks with homemade face plates. I think in total I've got 25 of them and you know for me this was the most efficient way to go about doing this. I would do them in batches of 20, 25 and kind of just do the whole assembly line process while doing so. All right so what I have here is an electric frying pan. If you're new here and haven't seen this before, it's full of hot melt glue. If you didn't see last week's video, this is the hot melt glue that I use. It comes from Canadian Tire, comes in a pack of 50. Uh, but really, any hot melt glue should work. So all I do is take the waste block that's mounted on my homemade face plates, dip it in the glue. Don't spare it. Now these are twice turned bowls, so you know they're relatively thick. I just push it down and then look down over top of it, line it up best I can. And because the bowls are already have a one inch thickness on them, then there's lots of room to, to uh, turn stuff away. So that's it, that's one, let's do the rest. You should be able to pick up one of these electric frying pans at a yard sale or something like that. Uh, I get asked a lot of times, what temperature do I keep it on? Well, it's on max. <laughs> that way I don't have to wait for it. Uh, you know, having lots of glue on the bottom of that uh, glue block is so important, so don't spare it. Right, so I usually only keep about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch of glue inside here. And the reason for that is, I can plug it in and it will be up to temperature in no time. If you got a lot more glue in here, then it's gonna you know take a lot more than that time-wise. But it's getting kind of low. There you go. That'll melt down and it'll be ready for the next time. Alright, I got three gouges sharpened and ready to go. Let's get her done. The majority of the turning is going to be done with the 5 8 bowl gouge by David Ellsworth, uh, which is a, made by Crown. And uh, you'll see me use a Hercules a little bit to trim back a couple inlays, but for the most part, it's just bowl gouge this week. I had really hoped on doing the first part of this video in real time and then just shooting the time lapse, but just because of the length of this video, I had to speed the footage up. But you'll get a good sense of how I trim up these bowls prior to doing any inlays. Now 
So the goal is to just get these trimmed up and get them ready for the inlays and just pay attention to close attention to the gouge, how it's presented to the wood as I enter into the rim area. You'll notice that the gouge is on its side or at 45 degrees anyway. So there's going to be some kickback from that. But once you can get that bevel running, then you can turn the flutes of the gouge up and you'll see it go above center and drop down into the very uh, base of the bowl. The tool was actually sticking on the tool rest, so I had to clean that up with a Brimo pad. If you have little dings and nicks in your tool rest, you should really file them down. That way the gouge will kind of flow well across the, the top of the tool rest. If you don't do that, sometimes it's going to be really hard to get a real steady clean cut if you know what I mean so this sanding is in real time and as you can see I'm starting with 60 grit and so all of my bowls that are in this category only get sanded to 320 I don't think you really need to go much higher than that if you wanted to you go higher on the inlay but I typically find that 320 will give you a good surface. So that's why I usually don't go any higher than that unless it's resin. So I start at the very outer rim, work my way in. You can see that how slow I'm going. Uh, the lathe is at a thousand RPM. Back it out once, flatten the rim. This isn't a real necessity at this point, but I don't know, I prefer to have the rim nice and flat. Keep in mind that you're gonna have an inlay in this and it's gonna be either sanded or trimmed back but I like to keep it flat and then back in and this I'll do this two or three passes and then I'll shut the lathe off and have a look at it so after two passes here it actually is looks pretty good and then the next grit the drill will be in the other direction and then the lathe will be in reverse and keep doing that until you get a nice beautiful surface all right so this piece is sanded to 180 you can see where I guess that was maybe a branch growing through there there's a little crotch area because this would have been the heart the very the pith of the tree would have been right here just like this so what I'm going to do here is actually put some tape over the outside of this and then on the inside this here is all side grain, so you know it typically doesn't stain. I'm trying to get the camera to show that better. It typically doesn't stain the slide as much as the end grain will. And you know, for, for the folks at home that are watching that, that aren't wood turners, so you know this this bowl here, there's the heart of the tree. So the tree would have been growing in this orientation, but the very center of the tree or the pith. So all of this around here on this side is considered end grain. And then on the other side, all of this is considered end grain as well. So end grain absorbs finish and glues more than side grain does. There's not even right there. That is considered side grain. So this, when you pour glue on here, typically doesn't stain. But once you start getting into the rings or into the end grain here, than it does. So anyway, I'm gonna throw some electrical tape on the back side of this, pour from this side, set it up, um, hit it with the accelerator, and then uh, I'll set this aside, trim some other ones, and then hit it with the 180 grit just to clean it up, and then hopefully this will be all filled in and we'll be able to sand to 320. So there's the tape on the back side so the glue can't run through and stain the other side. So there's a little pool of it there and I'll give that you know a minute or two to kind of wick down into there and then after that happens I'll hit it with the accelerator and I'll pull the tape off the back side and if it hasn't wicked all the way through then I will glue the back side as well. All right, let's see if it's wicked all the way through. I'm gonna bet that it probably hasn't. And it has not. So 
So, you know, if I wanted to, I could cut this knot out of here, but it's good and solid, so I'm not going to bother with that. The one thing that I usually will do, though, is fill the pith full of the glue. And this is the thin stuff again. That way, if there's any little micro cracks, it will keep it from migrating. So there, I'll give that about 10 minutes to set up and then uh, I'll go put this one back on the lathe. That way we can keep it going with this until it's done. Once the glue is set, I grind it back with the lathe turned off. Then I blend it all in and sand to 320 and get ready to cut the groove for the inlay. Make sure that you use a sharp parting tool because what can happen is if you get some tear out on the inside of the inlay area, you might through it, you might see it through some parts of the inlay where it's just clear glue or clear resin. All right, I'm going to be using Waterlux Medium Sheen on all of these bowls, so that's what this is. One of the important tasks from the finish right now is to get it down inside of that inlay area. That way the CA glue can't wick through the end grain and be seen on the inside and the outside of the bowl. There you go, that thirsty walnut sure drank that finish up. Uh, can't tell at all where that was glued. There's our little crack right here. Try and get the light to hit that correctly so you can see it. Everything looks normal. On the back side, there's where the knot came through. And again, there's no color difference at all there. So, you know, you'll notice that maybe the door is open. First coat of finish, I'm not too concerned about the door being open and stuff being embedded in it. This is just a protection coat so that when we do the inlay, if there's any glue runs or resin runs, then it's not going to stain the, the, the wood. So any coats that I put on after this though, I usually, usually make sure to shut one door. That way there's no airflow through the shop and crap getting embedded into the finish. All right, that's it for me today. We will set up a time-lapse video and I'll do the other four uh, tomorrow or the next day, I'm not sure. But uh, man, you can't beat that walnut. Sure is pretty stuff. And I know it's a little hard to see, but there's a lot of really nice figurative grain in this bowl too. All right, see you next, uh, see you tomorrow. I've been asked to show basically body position with the gouge. So that was one of the main ideas with, with doing the time lapse here. And I realize it may be fast, but you know, I, I don't show all of the bowls completely being done like this but I will show um, what they look like after the first coat of finish. So as I'm going along, you'll see me use some Starbine, uh, fill in some cracks or little areas that I want to do. But other than that, uh, I do show the, the uh, bowls after the first coat of finish. There's the second one. There was a little bark inclusion right here. I just filled that with the thin CA glue. I didn't think there's any need to remove it. Backside looks pretty nice too. There's where that comes through, that branch. I glued that as well. Some nice chatoyants there. This is a crotch piece, by the way. Number three coming up. So there's number three. Kind of cool, there was a branch coming down through there, so that's why there's two piths right here. But they're good and solid, no cracks in them, so I decided to leave it. Uh, lots of nice chatoyants right here. Real pretty bowl, actually. So finish running, I'm gonna wipe that off. At this stage, I don't really care about the finish if it runs because it's going to be sanded away anyway before the second coat goes on. But, you know, it's best to get rid of any of these runs if you see them.
All right, that's it. Number uh, number four coming up. In order to trim some length, I did, in fact, delete the footage from the third one being turned. Hopefully everybody can understand that. I want to show this one because there's actually an inlay that I put in this that will give you a real natural look. All right, so what I have here is coffee grinds is what this is. These aren't used, <laughs> they are new. I've got a little bit of a hole to fill in here, not very much. It doesn't go all the way through to the other side. So I think I'll throw some coffee in here. That way it's the same color as the bowl is. And then that way we're not forced to actually use the same inlay in the rim as we would down here. Again, I'm going to use the thin. There you go. I don't see no void. I'll give that about 10 minutes to harden up and then I'll trim this up again. And then we'll sand this one. So there is number four. Here's the area that we filled in with the coffee. Might do a little better job of that later on. Neat little couple of eyes here for no apparent reason. <laughs> yeah, it's just a beautiful piece of walnut. Number five. So at the beginning, I said that I'd sharpen three gouges and to be honest with you I have probably five or six. Some of them are getting kind of short and I mean as you grind them and you know I, I like a sharp gouge so I probably grind more often than a lot do your gouges will get shorter. So what a lot of times I'll do is use the short gouges on the outside of the piece and then the longer ones I'll use on the inside. And I didn't have to sharpen any more of the three gouges that was more than enough to take care of these five bowls. And there's the last one. Nice and clean. One little thing in it there. All right, well, that's it for me. See you tomorrow when we're putting the inlays in. Beautiful Canadian black walnut. All right, so here are the five inlay materials that we're gonna use. This is mussel shells. We've got some oyster here, turquoise, malachite. I called this wrong the first time I did an inlay on this and man, I've taken it ever since. So it's malachite and abalone. Uh, I actually had to watch a YouTube video to see how they basically polish this abalone up. It's got an outer crust on the outside of it that needs to be cleaned away. This was sent to us by James and uh, well it chewed up pretty good whatever is eating that it's certainly chewed it up quite a bit. So. In the video, they had a bunch of diamond stones, which I really don't have. And uh, one, they actually poured an acid on this. They didn't say what kind of an acid it was. So, you know, I'm not really wanting to go down that road. So all I did was take this over on my CBN wheel and grind this off. Most of this was gone anyway. So I just ground it off so that, you know, you can get that shimmery look through it. I think that that's a about as good as we're going to get with this just because of all these holes in it. But, you know, we've never done abalone and it should be a really cool inlay. So, we don't need to do anything with this. This is ready to use. Uh, I do have some mussel shells already smashed up, so I don't think that we need any more mussel done. But, I do need some oyster and this new abalone. So, let's do that. Let's start with the abalone. 
Uh, one real big word of caution here is that all of this mother of pearl, whether it's in this abalone or it's in this mussel shells, uh, inside of these oyster shells, anyway, it is very hard on your lungs. It's very toxic. So, you know, when you're smashing it up, it's probably not that big of a deal. But when you've got it on the lathe and you're sanding it, you need to have the dust collector right there collecting the dust. And you should be wearing a self-powered respirator to protect your lungs. Mother Pearl is very dangerous for your lungs. Pretty interesting stuff. Almost seems like this top layer you can maybe get rid of it. Again, this is my first time ever working with this stuff, so <laughs> I just don't know. Because it just really doesn't seem to be a ton of color inside of it. it certainly is there. I should mention that this is a steel plate. This is a four inch conduit piece. And I just use that to keep the stuff from flying all through the workshop when I'm hammering on it. So this is a sieve and it's, uh, I think it's 1 16th of an inch in size. So of course, I mean, ideally we're going to use pieces like this, space them around the rim. If you had the ability to cut it with a diamond saw, then that would be really cool too, but don't have. So this is a method that we're going to have to do, but I need to filter out all the fine pieces of this because we don't want that because I find it makes the inlay look dirty. There, that almost looks like it's got more dirt in it than anything really. Sand. And what I'm going to do is just kind of pick through this and pick out the real big chunks. Ones that I don't think will fit into the groove. There, I think that's going to be enough. Our inlay area in these bowls isn't very large. Get something to put that in. Now for the oyster shells, uh, this is the first time showing here me doing oyster shells, but uh, when you're smashing them up, you're going to find that they're kind of um, kind of connected. They don't smash apart typically like most shells do. Anyway, the ones that I've used in the past, I haven't, but these, um, for the life of me, I can't remember who sent these to me. They, I, they also sent uh, some mussel shells. So please, uh, in the comments, Tell the folks who sent them to me, I would appreciate it because I just lost the details to it. And when I'm doing these oyster shells, I typically get rid of the ugly stuff like that. It's okay if some of it is in it, but you know, I prefer not to have it in there. There you go, it's almost pure white. Here's my little oyster container, oyster shell container. Stuff looks kind of dirty. So this here is really good inlay material. It's, it's on here. So we'll keep all of that. And I guess along with that, I'll just throw that in there too. Again, I don't think that we're going to need a lot of this, so I'm just going to do up a one for now.
I don't know, maybe I have to do another one. There, that should be lots. All right, we're gonna start with the abalone on this one. Of course, abalone is, I'll call it a higher end shell. So the goal that I was trying to do here was to inlay larger chunks of it in a flat orientation. If it goes in on its side, then you're not really gonna get that color and that shimmer that you're looking for. Just going to nip off some pieces that are too big. So I did my best to fill in any of the voids, uh, but you know, in the end, because it was so, pieces of the inlay were so large, I had a hard time doing that. Well, she's certainly chunky. More than I usually do, that's for sure. There, I think this is going to look pretty good. Uh, what I'm going to do is put the material in all of the bowls and then we'll either use the CA glue or resin uh, all at the same time. Well, I don't have enough muscle shells. I guess I am going to have to do some. Be right back. So what I will do with a lot of uh, shell inlays is I'll leave a lot of them fairly large in size and then crush up some smaller ones to fill in around around them. Uh, again, that size variation I find looks better than just one specific size. There, I think that one's ready. The other one should be easier, hopefully. <laughs> it's taking a long time. All right, so here is the turquoise, and this actually was sent to us by Jim D, along with the malachite. Same deal. Thanks again, Jim. I'm going to leave a little channel for the glue to sit in here, because I'm going to need it to migrate through this inlay, so... Best to leave a little reservoir if you can. This is the malachite. So the turquoise and the malachite were able to be tooled back and I knew that I was going to be able to do that. So it's important to get that inlay laying in there nice and flat and uh, evenly throughout the inlay area. That way you don't do have to do as much trimming. Yo, that's ready to go. One left. All right, and there's the last one. It's gluing time. For all the inlays, we're going to use the Starbond Thin. I debated on uh, maybe using some uh, some resin, but I think that we'll just stick with the CA glue from Starbond. There, that's the first one. We'll set this aside and get the other ones. Very carefully. All right, so I've been leveling these. So this is levelish. There, that's got a reservoir of glue on it. So that's good. Set that aside. We're not going to use any accelerator or any of these pieces. That would be bad. Don't want any foaming. This is the abalone. Due to the coarseness of this shell material and the muscle shells, I probably could have got away with using medium. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it with the oyster shell because there was too much uh, fine material in it. 
Yeah, that's about all the glue that I'm going to put in there. I'm going to assume that this is going to be really hard to sand back. So it's best to leave the glue below the surface of the wood. And then that way, uh, when it comes to sanding it, it's a lot easier to sand back. If it is very similar to moon shells and mussel shells and other shells that I've worked with in the past. One more. All right, this is the last one. This is the mussel shell. All right, if you're curious to do all of these inlays with the CA glue, it took three ounces. I filled it and then I just filled it again. And it's about a half a bottle, if you can see that. So, you know, that's not bad. So what I'm going to do is let these sit right where they're at overnight. I will top up the inlay material if it has gone down, or the glue if it's gone down. And we will see you tomorrow when we grind these back. Should be some pretty nice inlays in here. Really curious to see what that abalone is going to look like when it's done. Anyway, we'll see you tomorrow. Alright, so it is the next day. And we're going to grind the inlay back. Some of them are proud of the surface. And we're going to use some 60 grit on a 6 inch random orbital sander. So what I'll do is grind back every one of these. Then we'll fill every one of them the same. Uh, but I want to start with the abalone because I'm really curious to see what it's going to look like. Like I said earlier, dealing with this shell material, it's best to just leave uh, the glue just below the surface of the wood. That way when you're, when you're grinding back the inlay like I am here with these PSA backed discs from sandpaper.ca, it's not really that big of a chore. If that glue is right up to the very top and you're trying to grind it back, you'll eat up a lot of sandpaper because the shell material is so, uh, so hard. And there you go, that's what it looks like after it's been initially ground back. And after it's filled, it will look amazing. Actually, really cool inlay. I really like the color of it as well. Now, of all the shells that I work with, I do find that Oyster is probably the easiest to sand. So you could probably bring that glue right up to the very top surface of the wood and it's usually not too bad to cut it back and there you go there's an extreme close-up still got some of those little areas on the side that are going to need the fine filling but other than that this one actually uh, filled in a lot better than the mussel shell and the abalone mussel shells now this is a tough one it can be very very hard to cut back sometimes you can get shells that have maybe been you know washed for a while and they're a little easier a little softer to grind back but if they're brand new shells i do find they're very difficult to cut back and i just pick them up off the beach and i've had people send them to me obviously off their beaches as well for the turquoise i the only reason that I knew I was going to be able to tool this is because I've already done this on the channel. So that in the malachite. So I knew that it wasn't going to be an issue tooling that back. So you'll save some sandpaper there. And uh, once it's sanded to 60 grit, it still needed some filling in some areas, which you'll see here in a minute. Very rare that you're going to be able to do an inlay in one shot unless maybe you're using resin and it goes into the pressure pot. And you've got a really deep inlay for 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 you able to trim it back. And last but not least is the malachite. I think it probably cut the best out of the between it and the turquoise. But this one had more voids left behind as well after uh, the initial sanding of 60 grit. In total, to do all of the grinding back here, I think I used 15 of those discs. All right, so for the second filling, this is the abalone. 
a little smaller material than the first round. Fill this up and it, that goes for everything. Uh, we don't have to worry about the oyster shell because it's, I might take some fine powder and put it in there. Uh, but the mussel shell is the same thing. I've mashed up a little bit. Finer material for the mussel shells so that it goes down and fills in all those little voids. So after it's filled with the finer material, of course we're going to do another application of glue. So it's important to have it leveled. And it's really easy to overfill it at this point and then you've got glue running down the side of your bowl. There, we'll set that aside. Uh, hopefully it's only going to be a couple of hours or so. I'll let it sit for probably about an hour and then I'll probably hit it with the accelerator to hopefully cure things up so that we can get it back on the lathe. Muscle shell next. So for this one I actually noticed that some of the glue from the previous day wasn't cured so I took some accelerator and sprayed it down inside there before I put the second filling in. I blew it out with the air hose but there must have been some left behind. But you're going to see that the glue starts to cure almost instantaneously and you'll see the vapors coming off it. Those, these vapors are actually quite toxic so make sure you use this in a well ventilated area. Uh, but anyway, didn't have to wait for this one to cure. And just using that fine material here on the uh, oyster shell, didn't really need any large uh, material at all in there. It actually uh, worked out quite nicely. For the turquoise, there was only just a couple holes that needed to be filled. So I just took my Phillips screwdriver, dipped it into the inlay bag, and just the little grooves in there will get out just about the perfect amount. That way you don't have to pour it out and make a mess. And then it gets its second application of glue as well. I was pretty confident in spraying that right away. I wasn't too concerned about foaming. And here I'm doing the same thing with the malachite as well. And I'm sure you've seen me tapping on the side of these bowls with that screwdriver. And really that's all you need for a vibrating device. I don't think there's anything fancy or needed for that. And of course it gets its second application of glue as well. All right, I'll probably see you in about uh, another hour or so. So this is why we put a coat of finish on. Now that wouldn't have been so bad because it's actually on side grain. But if that had gone down the end grain of a bowl, it would have stained it quite deeply. So you're going to see me initially cut these inlays back. And then once I've sanded it to 320, I usually go inside and outside the bowl. There's a lot of things that you'll miss. There's There'll be tiny little splatters of glue. So usually I will go in and sand that first coat back and that will get rid of any of that stuff. If you're curious, like I had to do another filling there, um, the malachite and the turquoise were actually, I think I only had to do one filling on the turquoise. The malachite was three fillings. Pretty much all of the shell fillings, except for the oyster shells, that took probably four or five fillings. Uh, one of the irritating things about working with shell material is that when you're sanding it, you'll expose a void. You'll take it off the lathe and you'll fill that void. And then you, you'll put it back on the lathe and start sanding and then you'll expose another void. So, you know, it's, it, at times it seems to be a never ending cycle, but if you stick with it, then uh, you'll certainly have a nice result. Now, most of these inlays came from me trying to be different from others. Uh, once I once I retired and start from once I retired from the army and then started doing shows, uh, you know I would go to a show and there's it was very hard to be unique in these shows. And so I had been doing these inlays for a very long time prior to that, and it was just a natural progression to to do these to do these inlays and be different from my other competitors. So, you know, I'm really glad that I've got this in my inventory and, you know, it's a tough business to make a buck in. So, you know, this is one of the things that if you're thinking about getting into this business, uh, make yourself unique and you will definitely be successful. And seeing what that abalone looks like, I wish I would have had that in my inventory back then. 
All right, again, this is the Waterlux Medium Sheen, and it uh, should be interesting once we get this on here to get a good look at it and see, um, see what it really, truly looks like with a finish on it. So this will definitely take another coat. Hoping that camera's picking that up. It's kind of hard to really show off. But I really like the look of it. Now, the wood didn't absorb this much finish this time around, even though I sanded pretty much the majority of it off. There's a really nice spot in that bowl. She's beautiful. Especially that area right there. All right, let's get a look at the other ones with the second coat. There's one of the fan favorites, muscle shells. Right in the center of this bowl, it's got lots of chatoyants there, compression grain around that knot. Another beautiful piece of Canadian black walnut. Number three going up. And there's the turquoise. Very pretty indeed. Very clean looking bowl. Very nice. Number four coming up. That green is awesome as well for sure. It's another really clean bowl as well. Number five is coming up. Lastly, there's the oyster shell. Almost pure white. Now, because this video is already way too long, tomorrow I'm going to buff with the Tripoli e buffing compound. Use the denatured alcohol to clean it off and put third coat on. And then we'll see you at the end when we're doing the bottoms. All right, so that's it for the video. Uh, as you can see, the glue blocks are basically on all of them. Uh, these require another coat of finish and it's Thursday. So got to finish this up. This wasn't really so much about the wood, more about the, uh, the inlay. And I think this is the star of the show. This is the abalone. And again, I will put some rotating footage up at the end, showing this off as well. Uh, very distinct color from any of the other mother of pearl type uh, shells that I've worked with. So uh, thanks again for sending that along. I mean, it's really cool. I'd hope to get more pieces like this. And again, I don't know if the camera is going to pick that up or not. Kind of facing upward so that it kind of looks like that all the way around it. It's probably about half. Uh, you'll see it in the rotating footage at the end. So that's the abalone, and it's certainly something new that we haven't done, and I think it's really cool. The other one that we haven't done is oyster shell. And there's what it looks like. It's actually quite easy to work with in sand. So if you're looking for a, uh, a shell that's it's easier on your tools and sandpaper, then oyster shell is it. Now this one is one of my most popular and very hard to keep in stock and that is the muscle shell inlay. Now that I'm here on YouTube I just don't have any production time. I can work these inlaid bowls in here and there to get them done but for the most part uh, it's very tough to do. Finish on this is actually pretty nice.
but I'll put another coat on it just like the others. But you know that the uh, the mussel shell inlay is certainly very very popular. And hey, they're just on the beach, you know. Number four is the malachite, dark green. Again, another very easy inlay to work with. Uh, it tooled back very brilliantly with the Hercules. I can't say what it would be like with the gouge, but I think that it goes well in this dark walnut bowl. And last but not least is the turquoise. And that also tooled and sanded brilliant, brilliantly as well. Now, you know, I could have I could have used um, I could have used resin as the binding agent in these. Uh, I just decided to stick with uh, the CA glue. We haven't really done a lot of CA glue inlays, natural inlays, so that's one of the reasons why I did that. Um, if you did use a resin, I would definitely recommend putting it in a pressure pot. Uh, you're going to see though that it's going to dip like this inside of the inlay. And that's not so much a bad thing when you're dealing with the turquoise and the malachite. Well, same thing with the shell material, I guess, as well. But, you know, it's for me, the CA glue, as long as you don't use the accelerator on the first pour, that's going to be your, you know, that's how you keep bubbles out of your work. And by sealing the inside of that groove, that's another thing that will help prevent bubbles from coming into that CA glue as it cures same thing would apply for resin as well so that's that's the fact that you put the uh the finish in there to prevent that and to also prevent the ca glue from wicking through and then seeing it on the outside rim of the bowl uh, that's the two reasons why i like to put the finish on the inside all right well that's it uh next week we're going to be doing a very unique wedding bowl something that we haven't seen before so please come on back for that and of course if you want to be entered into the three gallon kit at a hundred thousand subscribers slow getting there i'll tell you it, it's things have really slowed down on my subscriber count so hey, if you haven't subscribed please consider doing that but uh, if you want to be entered into that draw I'll put designer epoxy in the comments down below and of course by putting a comment down below you'll also be entered into my bowl giveaways at every five thousand so i think we'll probably be sitting at 93 maybe when this airs and um so yeah we're getting there slowly but surely so the next giveaway will be at 95,000. so please leave a comment down below all right well that's it take care stay safe don't forget the bell please share my videos with your friends and of course that thumb up thumbs up will always help as well all right see you next week